education uh, to learn more about the Bible, theology, things of God. And one of the courses they offer is called Biblical Worldview. And that's a course that I took, and the textbook is by the same title. And that course and book helped provide the impetus for this message. Taking that class gave me a little bit of an epiphany, if you will, about the importance as a Christian of understanding things from a worldview that is Christian or from a worldview that is biblical. You know, there will be times when people will ask you your take on things, especially if they know you as a religious person. They know you are a Christian. They'll ask your take on things. And it's important to be able to respond to those answers and to respond biblically. In 1 Peter 3, it says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And you know, I don't know everyone's story here, but I think we can all agree that we live in troubled times. I think everyone would agree with that. And as Christians, we have, we have hope. We have hope that we can offer to people. Our primary text this morning will be Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. It's a little long uh, for a uh, text for a message. But you can't go wrong reading scripture. If you leave here today and say, you know what? I don't like what Jim said. I don't agree with what Jim said. At least, at least you will have gone away hearing beautiful music about our Savior, hearing the Word of God, and the Word of God is powerful. It can change our lives. And so that's why we read the Scripture in our messages. You know, I take the invitation to speak at a church very seriously. I, I prepare, and but I'm, I'm fallible. I'm just a human, right? Uh, the Bible is inspiring. It's inspired. And so whenever someone speaks, it's kind of incumbent upon you to know the Bible yourself so you can decipher what the person is saying. In 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So if you do have a Bible with you, if you don't, that's fine, just listen along. But if you do have a Bible with you, Hebrews chapter 11, this is a, a passage probably many of you are familiar with, known as the faith chapter, because this is a chapter that is full of, of testimonies of the faith of people and the grace of God in their lives. So Hebrews 11, chapter 1, the, and the Bible says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death, and was not found, because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham, obeyed when he was called to go out to the place 
which he would receive an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of, with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, which builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland, and truly that they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country, therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he would receive the promises offered of his only begotten son of whom it was said, in Isaac, your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob, and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning on the top of the staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by the dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail to tell me of Gideon, and Barak, and Samson, and Jephthah, also of David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead raised to life again, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourges, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with a sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, and in dens and caves of the earth, and all these having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Shall we unite our hearts in prayer? Father in heaven, thank you for the sunshine out there. Thank you for this time we can gather together and read your word and learn from it. Help us all to be encouraged today. Help us to encourage one another. Thank you for Memorial Day weekend. Thank you for Memorial Day time where we have some reflection of those who gave all so we could live in a peaceable and safe country. We thank you for those who sacrificed everything. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. So with a message on worldview, biblical worldview, Jim, why this why this passage? Well, this is a classic passage on faith, right? And that, that one verse there says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so faith is important, but we don't live our lives as Christians with a blind faith. 
You know, there's many illustrations or statements in the Bible that we take by faith because we believe the Bible. Romans says that we're all sinners. For example, I believe that because the Bible said it. I also believe that because I've seen it. And if you don't think you're a sinner, then ask someone you live with. They'll tell you. You are a sinner. Okay, we're, we're sinners by birth. We're sinners by choice. And there's a lot of really nice people here in this auditorium. I would bet some of you sinned this morning driving to church. Broke the vehicle and traffic law. Drove a little too fast. Didn't use your turn signal. Didn't put on your seatbelt. Rolled through that stop sign. You know, sin is basically falling short of God's glory, right? It's Nancy, right? Nancy talked about having a, a deer accident this week. As I, as I was coming to church this morning, for whatever reason, I'm thinking, what if I hit a deer and, and I'm late for, you know, you know, for the service? That, that has nothing to do with the, the message, by the way, but when you're talking about that deer accident, it reminded me of, of things that can happen while you're driving. You know, you can obey all the laws of the land and still have a, have a problem. But anyway, you know, in my years at the police department, I, I spent over three decades at the police department. Believe me when I tell you, there is a, there is a lot of sin out there and to the point where it becomes uh, criminal behavior. And sometimes our sin is a sin of omission, where you should have done something and you did not. I don't know if this would have been a sin of omission, but, you know, as I came here, I uh, parked in the parking lot, and I love it that there's a fire department right next door. Uh, in, in retirement from the police department, one of the things I do, one of the things I do is I'm a chaplain with a local fire department, and so there's a couple guys over there, and I kind of didn't feel like going over there and talking to them, but I I did it anyway, and I invited them to the service, and I had a great conversation with them, and it was great. You know, had I not done that, would have been that have been a sin of omission. I don't know. Uh, in that situation, but in James 14, or in James 4, it says, Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So, if any of you are taking notes, point one, what is a biblical worldview? Or even, you know, what is a worldview? I think many of us go through life and we've got so much on our minds. We've got to mow the lawn, we've got to do the dishes, we've got to go grocery shopping. You know, we gotta, you know, maintain the car. We, you know, you gotta get up and go to work. We gotta take care of the kids. And we're not really thinking about things like worldview. A worldview is more than a political label. It's not, okay, I, I'm a Democrat, so that's my worldview. Or, or I'm an independent, so that's my worldview. Or I'm a Republican, so that's my worldview. It's, it's much more than a political worldview. And each one of you has a worldview, whether you can define that or not. It's basically how you see the world. When you have the news on, and there's a lot of bad news, when all this news comes in, how you process this, how you filter it, what you think the problems are, what the causation is of these things, that is your, what do you think the uh, answers are? That is your world view. How do you answer the most pressing questions in life? That's your worldview. How do you define truth? What is truth to you? You know, today, whether you agree with this or not, people are, are saying, well, that's your truth. That's my truth? I don't know. I was raised that there's truth and then there's opinions, right? There's your truth and my truth and, and everyone has their own truth. That's not real logical, that everyone has their own sets of truth. And it's, it's no wonder why there's so much confusion in our world today. Well, how do you develop a worldview? And how, how is your worldview formed? Well, it was formed by your parents, by your relatives, 
Maybe you spend a lot of time with your uncle and he talked to you about life. Your friends, your education. You, you've probably heard of people that were devout in the faith and then they went to college and all of a sudden they've, they've left the faith. They've stopped coming to church. Their, their education impacted their worldview. Books, what you're reading. Life experience, television, church, right now, social media. And so that's why as a Christian, it's really important to be aware of what you're taking in and how it relates to your Christianity. My time at the police department, did that impact my worldview? Yes, very much so. On things like how people parent, things like organization, crime and punishment, even concepts such as grace and forgiveness. So we're in church, right? And so I'm going to take it that most of you, if not all of you, know Jesus as your Savior or you're cert certainly interested in that, in that path. And so and as a Christian, it's important to understand life the happenings in our world from the perspective of Scripture, a Christian or biblical standpoint. And as a Christian, our source for ultimate truth would be the Bible. The standard of right and wrong does not change. You know, the philosophies of this world seem to be changing by the day. Let me read a passage here from Ephesians that was written a long time ago but could have been written this morning. Just a portion from Ephesians 4, chapter 14, that we Christians should not should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of, trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but, speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. One of my favorite verses of all time would be in Hebrews, another chapter, Hebrews 13, 8, where it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm, I'm a grandfather. I'm a father. And many of you are as well. And when our kids were growing up, they needed some stability. Kids need some stability, right? Well, <laughs> the truth is we all need stability, regardless of your age. We all need some st stability. We all need some peace. And Jesus provides that. He is a rock. And he doesn't change based on the latest polls, based on the latest opinions, based on the latest science. And, and by the way, I am all for science, but I think we have to be honest with ourselves and realize its limitations. Because today's science has made yesterday's science obsolete, and tomorrow's science will probably make today's science obsolete. So point one is, what is a biblical worldview? It's, it's how we, or what is a worldview? How we see the world. And a biblical worldview would be seeing the world through the lens of Scripture. Point two, who should have a biblical worldview? If you know the Lord is your Savior, you really should try to process things from a biblical worldview. And the Bible is where we begin and end with our beliefs about the significant matters of life. You know, in churches, even in Christian churches, there's all kinds of disagreements on some Pretty major things. I'm not talking about the call of the carpet or whether you serve Starbucks coffee or Dunkin' Donuts, which I do appreciate the Dunkin' Donut coffee here. That's my, uh, that's my favorite coffee. But, you know, there's all these disagreements, even in churches, even about something as significant as the gospel. And so, you know, why does that happen? You know, how can this be? Well, I would suggest it's because people are going <coughs> off from what the Bible talks about. You know, one of the important tenets of Christianity is unity. Not that we're clones of one another, not that we agree with every single last thing, but there should be some 
basic elements of unity. Jesus said in the Gospel of John 17, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, <coughs> I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Point two, who should have a biblical worldview? Christians. Point three, how to develop a worldview? How do you have a worldview part of your life? Well, you develop that from knowing the Bible. And I hope that you are spending time in your Bible. You can't really develop a worldview if you don't know the Bible. You know, my father, my father was a minister. He tells this story of, you know, sharing the gospel with someone. And the response would be, oh, well, I keep the Ten Commandments. Now, now you know, of course, that, that keeping the Ten Commandments doesn't get you to heaven, but, but this was the response he would get. And so his response, well, what are the Ten Commandments? And there was like silence. You know, how can you keep something that you don't know? And how can you have a biblical worldview if you don't know the Bible? You can't. You need to, you need to know the Bible. And there's three important things that, that we as Christians can do to grow in our faith. And I don't care if you're 15 years old, 50 years old, or 85 years old. These are things you can do to always be growing in your faith. One of them is prayer. Okay? Spending time communi communing with God. Number two is be in the Word, be in the Bible and then three, conversate with others about faith, whether it's another Christian who's mentoring you or another Christian that you're mentoring or somebody that you're sharing the, the gospel with. I enjoyed my time over there with the uh, firefighters there. Did I, did I full-blown share the gospel? No, but I hope I gave them some things to think about. As a Christian, when we become aware of something, we need to vet it through what the Bible would say. What does the Bible say about it? And the reason why I chose this, this passage from Hebrews 11 is the testimony of faith long ago of all these Christians. Their faith, their walk of faith, is commended for us today. I'm comfortable in saying that these people had a worldview that was consistent with their faith in God. As followers of Christ, what information are you taking in when you see the events of our world? We do live in a dark time. You know, are we living, are we living in the end of the age? You know, Jesus talks about the end of the age. Are we living in the end of the age? Well, the Bible does say that no one knows the day when the Lord will return, but Jesus does say in, in Matthew, but as the days of Noah were, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. It is a pretty troubled time out there with what we're seeing. Point four, a biblical worldview starts with a faith in God. A biblical worldview starts with a faith in God in that he is the creator of this world that we see out there. Let me read again verse 3 of, hello, of Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. You know, the Bible says that God created this world. If you attend public school or a public university and you were to make that known, that you believe that, there's a fairly good chance that you would be mocked and scorned. What does the world say? What does the world's philosophy say about how this world began? 
a theory. They don't have they don't have the answers to that. They have theories. What about when life begins? When does a human life begin? You ask our leading scientists today, and they're not going to give you an answer. They don't know, or they don't want to know. In Jeremiah, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. What about the meaning of life? Why are we here? Why is Jim Woodward living on this earth? I think if you were to go to a Buffalo Bills stadium and interview everyone going into the stadium, you'd probably get 70,000 different answers. I don't know. Probably one of the more common answers would be, I don't know why we're here. The Bible gives us purpose for life. The Christian law gives us purpose in life. In Micah 6.8 it says, He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly? God wants us to be a just people. To love mercy. And to walk humbly with your God. That's just one of many verses we could use. What's the biggest fear that you have? You know, apparently one of the biggest fears that people have is public speaking. I think probably some people are afraid of losing their retirement uh, in, the, in the stock market or afraid of being alone. I think there's a lot of lonely people out there. I think that's a fear. Afraid of you know, the work not coming in. There's people that are self-employed and they're waiting for the phone to ring and it may not be as busy as they would like. I would suggest the biggest fear that is out there is the fear of death. And it's something that we all have to face. None of us, none of us get a pass on that, Right? What does our world's philosophy and thinking offer you on your deathbed? That's a rhetorical question which I will answer. They have nothing to offer you. Nothing. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, so we, talking to Christians, are always confident, confident, isn't that a great word as a Christian? Knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, there's that word again, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. For the Christian Passing away is not something to be feared. I'll never forget when my father was on his deathbed. And I knew that he was a Christian. I knew that he had served his God for many years as a missionary overseas, as a minister of the gospel. He never wavered in his faith. And yet, I knew his time on this earth was not long and I wanted to be sensitive to that and I asked him if he was afraid of going to the other side and I'm convinced that as a Christian when you are in those moments that God gives you the grace that you need and my father I guess you could say he admonished me one last time. What am I supposed to be afraid of? He was not afraid at all.
The Bible tells us how this all began. The Bible tells us when our life begins. The Bible can tell us the meaning of life. The Bible can help you and direct you to know that you have eternal life. Point five. We've kind of been discussing this. The Bible has the answers to life's biggest questions. You know, we all as Christians, in a sense, should be theologians. You know, typically we reserve that word for people like C.S. Lewis or Charles Spurgeon, people really famous. But in a sense, if you're a Christian, you should be a theologian. The study of God. And in our day today, when we look at the thinking in our world, Sometimes we're just left scratching our head. You know, what is this world coming to? The world's confused. The world doesn't have hope. But as a Christian, we have the answers. We have the answers for ourselves. We have the answers for others. And when you talk to people who don't have the faith of the Lord Jesus, they, they very well may admit to you that they don't have hope, that, they, that they're confused. And if you have conversations with those who are not in the faith, be humble, don't be argumentative. But as that passage we just read about, talked about being confident, be confident. Know what you believe and why you believe it. Have a biblical worldview. Well, point six, um, some final thoughts as we live our lives and think biblically as Christians. Creation. How did this all happen? The Bible has the answer to that. It says that God made it. Sin. The Bible says we're all sinners in need of rescue. Jesus said in John 14 that he is the way. Living with our Family, with our spouse, or interacting with your family, our Bible, our biblical worldview impacts that. The Bible talks much about relationships, how to interact with one another, it talks about the family, your work, your vocation. Romans 12 says to not be slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Sometimes we have jobs. <coughs> I, I, I live in the real world. Sometimes we have jobs that we don't like. Right? But guess what? Sometimes we may have to get up and go to work anyway. And have to put food on the table. But when you see it from a biblical worldview that it's an opportunity to serve God and to be a testimony of His grace in your life, it can change your perspective. Politics. We live in a country where we, we can vote. Not everybody has that privilege. I mean, I hope all of you are voting and voting your faith. Don't compartmentalize things. You know, your faith is not something that you turn on and off like a light switch. You turn it on and it impacts every area of your life. Science, we've already talked a little bit about that. History, arts. Be careful what music you listen to. You listen to some music and it can really keep, put you in a bad place. Put you in a dark moment. Listen to music that will inspire you. Turn your direction towards God. Culture. If your traditions somehow, some way conflict with the Bible, maybe some of your traditions need, need to be put away. You know, the church. What is the purpose of of a local New Testament church like this. You know, we probably all know, but we all need, if there's anything that we need in life, it's, it's reminders. Jesus said in Matthew 28 about the church, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, 
even to the end of the age. As I was reading that recently, it brought me back to a moment when I was at the police department in the, uh, in the roll call room. And apparently I was like sitting alone with no other officers around me and, and the sergeant, you know, lamented that, oh, you know, Jim's sitting over here, you know, by himself. And I was kind of known as the, the religious guy at work. And as soon as the sergeant said that, an officer on the other side of the room said, Jim's never alone. If you're a Christian, you are not alone. You are not alone. Well, thank you, each and every one of you, for being here today. It's an honor to, to be here. I'm going to have a closing pastoral prayer and a closing benediction after that. I'll be at the back of the auditorium if anybody would like to say hello or if anybody has a prayer request that I can make note of and, and pray about that. I do thank you again for being here. I hope you enjoy the rest of your holiday weekend. May God bless you. Would you join me in prayer? Father in heaven, thank you for these passages from your word, which are, as, as, as Hebrews says,